Well, hey there. Good morning, Bayside. This is Pastor Glenn coming to you from Tampa, Florida. Sherry Dan and I are down here visiting my mother's place down here, and this is Super Sunday. You can see uh, Tampa happens to also be the site of Super Bowl 55. You can see right behind me is Raymond James Stadium. So I just wanted to drop in this morning just to say happy Lord's Day, happy Super Sunday. You can see this is also Jersey Sunday. I don't know how many of you all are wearing your favorite jersey, maybe they're on site or online, but you can see I'm wearing my favorite jersey today. And I just want you to know that later on today, around 6.30, I'll be going home and Lord willing, watching on television along with many of you all. But later on today, there'll be two teams gathering in this stadium behind me for the right to become champions of the NFL. They'll be the Kansas City Chiefs. Some of y'all will be rooting for them. They'll also be, uh, they'll be playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Some of you all will be rooting for them. Again, some of you all may not be rooting for anybody, may not be even watching, and that's okay. But they'll be meeting for the right to become champions. And I want you to know today that we have, as followers of Jesus Christ, the greatest champions, the greatest of all time, and that is Christ. Because Jesus Christ defeated the greatest opponents of all time. He defeated the opponent of death, and he defeated the opponent of Satan, our greatest adversary. He did that by going to the cross of Calvary and dying for our sins, and then three days later, walking out of that grave. And that's why we can celebrate today. That's why we can gather today and worship, because we celebrate and we worship a risen Savior and he is by far the greatest of all time and, and the good news is that Jesus Christ loves you and he loves me unconditionally and he wants to have a relationship with us so I praise God for that you know again later on these two teams will be gathering and they have been committed they have been devoted to their training they have been devoted to getting to this point they have learned their opponents they have learned the playbook. They have been training and working hard. And that's why we're going through this series. We just, we, we've kind of put this word uh, for our year, devoted. And later on, Brother Bob is going to open up the word of God. And he's going to talk to us today about being devoted to prayer and being devoted to missions. And, and, and folks, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be devoted to our training and learning and growing in Christ. That's my prayer for you all today. I'm I'm just so thankful that you all are with us. Uh, I praise God for you. Let me have this word of prayer for you as you begin this time of worship. And Lord God, we're thankful for the church back home at Bayside. I miss them, but Lord, I'm so glad that they've gathered today. And uh, Lord, we're here to worship you and you alone. I pray for brother, brother Bob as he opens up the word. And that, Lord, that you speak a mighty work through him, a mighty word through him, Father, about prayer and missions. And help us, Lord, to be devoted to our training. As 1 Timothy reminds us, help us to be devoted to righteousness. Help us to be dedicated to training in your word and to righteousness. And, Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, be with our worship team as they come here in a few moments to lead us in song. Bless them. Lord, again, be with your church back at home, wherever they might be. Watch over them and care for them, I pray. Lord, it's always a super Sunday when we can gather in your name. Praise God for you, Lord, and for your salvation and your grace. In your name, I pray. Amen and amen. Well, there you go, folks. I just want to show you one more time. Behind me, there's Raymond James Stadium. The Lombardi Trophy will be hoisted later on today. But, Lord, uh, I just, I'm so thankful uh, that you have given us this opportunity, God, to gather in your name. Bless you, church. Look forward to seeing you all when we get home. Hope you have a wonderful day of worship. God bless you. See you real soon. All right. Good morning, church. Happy Super Sunday. It's good to see everybody here. Not literally. I don't see anybody. But uh, it's great to have you guys here. It certainly looks a lot warmer where Pastor Glenn is than here today. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to continue on. We're going to serve the Lord no matter where you are. And we're going to start out by singing one of my favorite old songs, I Saw the Light. And this will, should get you warmed up, right? So let's get started.
Good stuff, good stuff. The next song is In Christ Alone, and this is the gospel message right here in this song. What a great song, and, and that is In Christ Alone. That is all our hope, all our future. Everything that we have to look forward to is in Christ alone. loves every person in every city, town, and village, in every home, hut, and yurt. They speak different languages, they eat different foods, they believe in different things, and God loves them all. But they don't all know about God. Billions of people all over the world don't know about God's love. They've never heard of the gospel. They don't know that He sent His Son, Jesus, to rescue them, to give them hope. Not everyone knows, but they can, if someone goes to tell them. That's why God made me, to worship Him and to share His gospel. I'm still learning what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be more like Him. But one thing I know for sure is that Jesus loves the world, the whole world. I want to love the world like Jesus. I want to be a kid on mission. I have a part in sharing the gospel with everyone everywhere right now.
Good morning, church. Boy, nothing finer than hearing a child talk about missions and how since Jesus loves us, we are to love the world. You know, it's interesting, Bayside Church. We are a missions-minded church. We've been to Guatemala. We've been to Bath, Maine several times. We hope to go this year. We hope to go to Guatemala later on this year. Uh, New City Church, uh, of course, is where we go in Bath. Also, Graffiti Church in Baltimore and Charlie Brown and Fort Howard Church and Pastor Greg. And then, of course, we give to the North American Mission Board as well as the International Mission Board for our, our North American missionaries and missionaries around the world. We are a church that supports missions. And it's not just supporting missions around the world. It's also here in our backyard. I am so grateful for the sign as you leave the parking lot here in Bayside. It says, you are now entering the mission field because we can go overseas we can go to another state but we can go on mission right where we are so praise God for that we are thankful that you are joining us today uh, we've got a few announcements so the first one is uh, we want to thank you also for your gratefulness and your um, your willingness to support this church you can give four different ways you can drop it off at the boxes in the sanctuary if we, when we meet again you can also give online you can text and of course you can mail those in. And we thank you for the ones that are so faithful in giving because we know even though our schedule looks a little different than it did this time a year ago, we are still called to give. We are still called to, to support the ministry of this church and we thank you for the way in which we're able to do that and we are grateful to the Lord for using those monies in a way that honors him and glorifies his kingdom. We will talk about some announcements later on um, after, the, after the message. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for our tithes and offerings, uh, for those who are faithful givers. And Lord, we pray that, that Bayside Church would be good stewards of the, money that are, the monies that are given. That Lord, that they would honor you and glorify you. And that Lord, you would multiply those 10, 50, 100 fold. And Lord, we've seen that happen. We've seen that happen certainly with our, our new church building. And we've seen that happen when we've given to missionaries around the world and certainly locally. And we thank you for that, Lord. We know that you will guide and direct the monies given. And Lord, we are just so grateful and thankful that this is a missions-minded church. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, Lord, about missions and also prayer, that Lord, we are all called to be missionaries. We may never be called to go out of the country. We may not even be called to go out of the state, Lord. But we are called to be ambassadors, to advance the kingdom of the, of, the, of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that people hear the good news and they, they embrace it, Lord, and their lives are changed. And more important, their destination is changed so we could glorify you in heaven. So Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. May you get all the glory and honor and may you be center and central to all things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to continue with, oh, praise the name, and that is something we have to do all the time is praise the name of Jesus. That is why we are here. That is why we are on this earth, and I talked about it Wednesday night. If you want to know what the meaning of life is, that's the meaning of life. You were created to praise and glorify the name of Jesus. So let's do that now with, oh, praise the name. Savior, all that 
pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for endless days we can sing your praise. Every day of our lives, we, we just praise you. Thank you for everything we've been given. We've been given so much, I can't even imagine how you have given us everything that you have been aired, everything that you've been given, Father, you shared with us. A sinful, sinful people, and you have shared it with us. So why else praise your name? Thank you so much for this wonderful gift you've given us, the gift of salvation. Lord, I pray for uh, Brother Bob as he brings your message. And Father, I pray that every single word that he speaks today would be your words, not his, that they would come from your scripture, your word. Thank you again uh, for him, for his uh, sacrifice, for the time that he put in this message, Father. Again, we ask that it would touch each and every heart today that, that hears this message. It's a message of prayer, something that the church needs to know about. Lord, it's, uh, it's one of the weaknesses that the church has. And, Lord, I pray that through this message today that it would be a point that is strengthened. Thank you again for the gift that we have to pray. Thank you for your example of prayer. And, again, be with Bob today. And I thank you again for all the wonderful blessings we have been given. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What is prayer? In many ways, prayer is a simple thing to do. But sometimes we can have a limited view of what prayer actually is. Now, don't get me wrong. Prayer is a means of supplication and making requests to God. It's just that prayer is also more than that. Prayer is both talking to God and having a relationship with Him. Prayer is making yourself available to God and allowing Him to make Himself available to you. Prayer is a way to ask God for provision for tomorrow and a means by which he provides the sustenance we need for today. So we pray not to get our own way, but rather we pray to align ourselves to God's will. We pray not for things that might create independence from God, but rather we pray as an expression of dependence upon God. Yes, God loves to hear our prayers and requests. He listens to them, he delights in them, and he responds to them. It's just that prayer is also where we can confess our sins, praise His goodness, listen to His voice, and be reminded of truth. Prayer isn't just a way to ask for more fruit, but through prayer, we begin to bear more fruit. Prayer isn't just words spoken at specific times during the day. It's living with a mindset that allows God to transform you throughout all of your days. So don't think of prayer as just an activity done before meals or bedtime, but rather, Think of prayer as a way of life. Well, that video certainly was very indicative of what prayer is. And I think it is a misnomer uh, because we think that we should pray before meals or before we go to bed. And those are good times to do that, but it's so much more than that. But before we dive into the message, as Pastor Glenn so eloquently said... Today is Super Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know if you can see that, but we, our bulletins today were indicating that. And uh, I know that if he had a ticket, he would certainly be going to the game today. Um, I think he and Luke got close a few years ago when the Super Bowl was in Texas. They actually went down there the day before and did the NFL experience. I don't think they actually got to go in, but it was, a, of course, it, it happened to s snow down there, one of those rare times in Dallas when it snowed, but he said they had a great time and they did get to see some former NFL players, so that was fun. So happy Super Bowl Sunday, as we know, as Glenn already mentioned, Super Bowl 55, can you believe it? Now, the reason that Super Bowls are so special to me is my dad was a huge football fan. He played football in high school and he had four sons and we all played football. I played guard, end, and tackle, sat on the end of the bench, guarded the water jug, and tackled anyone who came near me. Sorry, that's an old joke. But my dad loved football, and I've watched every Super Bowl since the beginning. So a quick quiz uh, question for you. Who played in the first Super Bowl? Well, 50% of the teams are in it this year, Kansas City against Green Bay. So it was Green Bay, Kansas City, Super Bowl one, and now Super Bowl 55, Tampa Bay, and Kansas City. I'm pulling for Kansas City because I think someone other than Tom Brady ought to receive a ring, but that's a personal thing. So also, the most watched Super Bowl was Super Bowl 49, speaking of Tom Brady, when they defeated the Seattle Seahawks on that last second interception in the end zone, which just broke my heart. 
Uh, that was fe February 1st, 2015, and over 114 million people tuned in. And that's about a third of the country. That's a lot of people watching Super Bowls. So when I think about that, it reminds me of a story. A guy named Joe receives a free ticket to the Super Bowl from his company. When Joe arrives at the stadium, he realizes the seat is in the last row in the corner of the stadium. Joe realizes that he's closer to the Goodyear blimp than he is to the actual action on the field. Halfway through the first quarter, Joe notices an empty seat 10 rows off the field on the 50-yard line. Oh, my goodness. He takes a chance and makes his way to the empty seat. As he sits down, he asks the gentleman sitting next to him, excuse me, is anyone sitting here? The man said no. Excited to have such a great seat for the game, Joe again inquires of the man next to him. This is incredible. Who in their right mind would have a seat like this at the Super Bowl and not use it? The man replies, well, the seat belongs to me. I was supposed to come with my wife, but she passed away. This is the first Super Bowl we haven't seen together since we were married in 1967. Well, that's really sad, but still, couldn't you find someone to take the seat, a relative or a close friend? No, the man replies, they're all at the funeral. It's not original. You've probably heard it before. I used to be a huge football fan, especially a Super Bowl fan. I loved playing Super Bowl trivia. I still like football. However, my devotion has changed. Remember the word devotion? Pastor Glenn mentioned it, and he started a series several weeks ago. He's been preaching on the topic. I used to live and breathe football. Answering a question about football was like breathing. I studied it a lot, so it became second nature. Not so much anymore. Wonder why that is. As I mentioned, Glenn has been preaching on devoted Christian disciplines. Four weeks ago, his message was on worship. And if you weren't able to watch that message, you can still get it online. Three weeks ago, he taught on the study of God's word, which was really a very powerful study. Uh, you can also view that. Today, we're going to look at prayer and missions. And I know those are two enormous topics to discuss. And I'm, I'm not going to do it justice. As I said, that video that we saw a little while ago does a really, really good, it gives you a good description of what, what prayer is and what it should be but I hope that we'll take some things away from it. For Christ followers, prayer should be like breathing. It should be second nature. Think about that for a minute. Second nature. You know, when I think of that, I think of Jesus and his relationship with God the Father, where Jesus, when it was very early in the morning, went away. He got out to a place by himself and he prayed on his own. And then when the disciples, not before Jesus died and was resurrected, but afterwards, the disciples prayed. I mean, look what happens in Acts. Look what happens all through the New Testament about people whose lives were changed because they came to know Christ, but also because they prayed. Prayer is so important. It should be as much a part of our daily lives as anything we do. It should be, but is it? David Jeremiah, of course, he's a pastor, well-known pastor, he says, the greatest adventure of our lives is to embark on companionship with God through prayer. Prayer is a great privilege. It's the way we commune. We commune with our Creator, the way we talk to our Father. It's also one of our most neglected disciplines as individuals and as a body. Now, this is a man who preaches and teaches to thousands of people at his church every week and the millions around the world. And if he says it's one of the neglected disciplines, he would know that because he knows a lot of people. And I think it is interesting. We, we make prayer out to be something that it's not. I think we make it out to be a lot more difficult and challenging than it is. But it's so important. It is how we commune. It is how we communicate with our Father. The Red Sea Rules is a book written by Robert J. Morgan. It reveals even in the midst of seemingly impossible situations, God promises to make a way for us. God promises to make a way for us. It's what he did with Jesus, right? His loving guidance protects us through danger 
illness, marital strife, financial problems, or whatever challenges the devil places in our path. By the way, even a pandemic. In the book, Red Sea Rule Number 4 is prayer. Prayer should be the backbone of every Christ follower. In Exodus 14.10, it says, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. You think? They feared greatly? Oh, yeah. They had just come out of Egypt. Moses is leading them. It's the desert. Not a lot of things to do. I'm sure they greatly feared him. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Praise God for that. Cried out to the Lord. We have all been there where fear has overtaken us and paralyzed us, overwhelmed us to the point where we don't know what else to do. That's when God steps in. But I think a lot of times we, we think that that's what has to happen. We have to go through a crisis mode. And that's, that's not how God wants us to pray. He wants to pray unceasingly. He wants, to pray, wants us to pray constantly. It doesn't mean that 24-7, 365, we're praying. But it means we have to be in that spirit of prayer. And we should be praying for large things, small things, and everything in between. Patsy and I have four children. They're all grown now, and three of them are married. And we've got grandchildren now. We pray for them all the time, just like you all do with your children, your grandchildren. I have family, extended family, sisters, brothers, nieces, and nephews. I pray for them all the time. This church, as you all know, we also have Who's Your One, where we pray for those who are not believers. Praise God for a church who prays for people to come to know Jesus Christ. That's what we should be doing. So back to the story of uh, the, the, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Some situations in our lives offer us two options, panic or pray. And we know that the Israelites were in that panic mode, weren't they? The author says that his tendency is to panic just like the Israelites. We know the story. The Israelites were fresh out of Egypt and on their way to the promised land. Oh, man, very, very exciting. But before that happened, something occurred. Pharaoh, like he did so many times with the ten plagues, had a change of heart. He sends his best warriors and his best chariots. You know, when I think of a warrior and a chariot, I think of Pastor Rick Gaither. He'd have made a fine uh, Egyptian uh, chariot guy. I, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe his beard would have been a little longer. But, you know, you think about it, these were These were manly men. These were well-trained and um, well-armed. Uh, the Israelites have their backs to the Red Sea. So we've got... The Egyptian army here, we got the Red Sea here, and the Israelites in between, and it's like an oh my goodness moment. But through all the hyperventilating, heart racing panic attacks, the Lord has always shown that it, prayer is how we can, if we choose, to stay even tempered, cool headed, and strong spirited, even in crisis. See, we don't have to panic when we know that God is in control and we believe that God is in control. And that's where our faith is. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you know not. Great and mighty things, that means godly things, things that we can't comprehend otherwise. Oh, and by the way, I'm going through a lot of scripture, so I apologize. Maybe just write the scripture verses down, and you can look at them later. Um, but there's going to be a lot. There's about, I think, 12 or 14 of them. The next one is 1 John 5.14. This says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Pastor Rick and I were teaching on Wednesday night, and I, I mentioned something about, if you, if you pray for a little red Corvette, unless it's God's will, you're probably not going to get that. This is the key to this verse, according to his will. And I remember Rick pointing out saying, not our will, but Lord, your will be done. And he hears us. And then Jeremiah 29, 12, this is, a, 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 again, a, a well-stated and well-known verse. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. See, our God is not a God that is way up here, and is just twiddling his thumbs and is not interested. He's very interested in us. As a matter of fact, 
He's so interested that he sent his only begotten son to take our place on the cross. So if we are praying in his name, he will listen to us. When we can't move forward, move sideward, or even step backward, it's time to look upward and to ask God to make a way where there seems to be no way. Are you going through something right now where there seems to be no way? If you haven't, you will. Maybe we're in the midst of it or maybe you're coming out of it. But I will say this, in my life, I've been a believer now longer than I'm a non-believer. I've had some very, very desperate and difficult times in my life. And God has never let me down. I still had to go through the trials and the tribulations and the rocky roads, but God was always there. And he can be there for you too. King David faced this challenge in his final days as a fugitive from, from King Saul. You remember this, Saul, Saul was so jealous and envious that he wanted to kill David. Now you remember what the Bible says about King David, right? Before he was king, David was a man after God's own heart. Well, Saul was trying to kill this man because he just couldn't stand what was going on in David's life because David had that righteous relationship with God. So Saul sought to kill him. In 2 Samuel 22, 7, David is desperate and he cries out. In my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry came to his ears. When we pray to God, our desperation goes to God's ears. I, I can't explain that. I don't understand it. I don't know how God can hear millions of people praying at the same time. But God does not lie. The Bible does not lie. It's his infallible word. And he does it. He hears us. So can you imagine being one of millions of Israelites having just come across the desert, seemingly just wandering, escaping the slavery in Egypt, as most of us escape the slavery of sin in much the same way and all of the sudden coming to the Red Sea. What would you do? You can't go forward and you notice behind you is a cloud of dust, again, representing the entire Egyptian army. And they're coming to bring you back to Egypt or worse. You know, who knows what would have happened in the desert. It was here that the context of Exodus 14, 10 and 11 comes into view. Now I'm going to read 10 again, but I'm also going to read 11. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Now Moses didn't know what was going to happen. But Moses had great faith, didn't he? Now, the people didn't. They abandoned that. At every turn, the Israelites whined, and they cried, and they complained. Praise God for Moses. If God asked me to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, I, it wouldn't have been a pretty picture. But Moses was faithful, and he knew that God was going to lead them. Again, he didn't necessarily know the Red Sea was going to part, but he knew that God was going to take care of it, and he was going to show the people that. It is here that we hear from Moses in Exodus 14, 13. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. We hear that all the time in New Testament. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. And this gives me chills when I think about it. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. God took care of the Egyptian army once for all. And the people of God would never have to fear them again. Now, this answer from God was not due to their regular daily quiet time prayer habits. You can, you can bet on that. Important as they are, I'm talking about crisis time prayer. These were prayers of importance, desperation, and intensity. Prayers during life-threatening or soul-shattering events like the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or a financial or marital crisis, things that make us stop and think, what in the world is going on? And I can't go another day. Lord, I need you. 
When we get worried about something, we should lift our hearts to heaven and say, Lord, followed by the name of the one we are concerned for. We are called to pray for others also. On Wednesdays, anywhere from 15 to 20 folks gather, either here at church or through Zoom at 5.30 to pray for others. Now, we pray intercessory, which means for others. We pray thanksgiving. We pray for forgiveness. But the really neat thing we do is we pray, uh, if you've seen the, the um, Bayside prayer list that Cassie and Joyce send out every week, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of church members and their families who have major medical maladies. I think Cassie, Cassie's in the audience uh, this morning, I think the last time I checked, there were almost 20 people on this Bayside list that are dealing with cancer, either going through treatments or have just found out about it. And we pray for them each Wednesday evening. And of course, all through the week. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is mighty. And prayer is godly. It's a sweet time to pray with the saints. It's also a great blessing, and it seems to intensify the prayer time and sends it to heaven with greater velocity. You know, when God's people gather together, it, it speeds to heaven with greater velocity. Again, don't know how that happens. But God does. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. I know when I'm here on Wednesdays or tuning in by Zoom, I feel that, that the Lord is present. We had, I think we had over 20 this past Wednesday. We had a couple of newcomers. It is a praise God opportunity to pray with brothers and sisters in Christ, certainly as members of the church. The children of Israel cried out together. They were terrified and absolutely desperate and with much fear. And look at how the Lord responded. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us then approach God's throne throne of grace, we approach, uh, we approach that throne by praying to God, by asking him, by him working in and through our lives. Was this a time of need for the Israelites? Were they scared? Oh my goodness, absolutely. Like a lot of us are today. Pandemic or not, there's so much uncertainty. There's a lot of scary things going on out there. To help us in our time of need, this is all of us. We are all without hope and living in fear if our lives are lived outside of that relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, God doesn't always say yes to all our requests, going back to the little red Corvette, but he listens with unusual attentiveness when two or more gather in united prayer and he responds in his own way and time with power and wisdom. Praise God that he doesn't give us everything we ask for because we wouldn't be able to handle it. God knows what we need and when we need it and how we need it. Always remember this truth. Unless we plead in faith, our prayers can do more harm than good. So we have to believe, not just pray, but believe. James 5.15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So we can pray for our brothers and sisters. We, we can pray for those who are going through difficult situations and maybe even having a, an issue or two with sin. We can pray for them also. We do it in the name of Christ, but we can lift up those brothers and sisters. This verse says that when we pray, we pray with boldness and confidence that he can answer it. It may not be answered, but our faith is in him. Not in politics, not in medicine, and not in the world. Our trust and our hope is in him, is in God above, who designed us and created us and knows us better than we know ourselves. Thomas Watson, the Puritan writer, said, Faith is to prayer what the feather is to the arrow. It feathers the arrow of prayer and makes it fly swifter. And here we go again. And pierce the throne of grace. When I think of that, 
throne of grace, I think of God sitting on that throne, extending his hands, right and left hand, and extending that grace and mercy to mankind. We know that his greatest grace and mercy was sending Jesus Christ, send his son to die on a cross for us so that we would have opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of him and spend eternity in heaven. There's nothing better than that. We all face tremendous challenges and sometimes overwhelming odds. Hmm. But we are called to pray urgently, unceasingly, unitedly, and trust the great prayer answering God who grants mercy and imparts grace to help in times of need. You know, and life may be great for you right now. Maybe everything's going really, really well. You know, maybe you got a job and maybe you're, you're doing well and you got the, the college loans paid off and you got a nice car and a nice house and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we still need to ca call out and cry out to God because those, those circumstances, those situations can change overnight. But even if they don't, we are to praise God for that. We are to thank him for that. We are to be thankful. We talked about that in, at Thanksgiving, being thankful in the large things and the small things. We talked about the 10 lepers uh, on Thanksgiving and how uh, Jesus healed 10 lepers. One of them came back and thanked him. God calls us to be thankful and grateful to him. Okay, moving on. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, and this is, a, an, again, another familiar verse, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So repentance and prayer, they go hand in hand. They are hand in glove. They, you can't have one without the other. We can pray to God, but if we're not Christ's followers, then God doesn't hear us. We have to repent. We have to turn from our sins. And then we, we, we pray to the Lord. We are to repent. When we turn away from all our stuff and begin to seek God's face, stuff, I think that's a biblical term, maybe not, and begin to seek God's face with all our hearts, God will be found by us. He will answer us. And he will act on our behalf. When God's people repent and begin to pray and seek his face and turn to him, then deliverance will be at hand. Deliverance. And again, if you're a Christ follower, praise God for that, thank him for that. But you also may be one that can share Jesus with others. As we talked about earlier, the mission field is all around us, at work, at home. Um, if we're, if we're kind of going out again, going into stores, or maybe our, our children are playing sports again, that may be your opportunity to be Jesus Christ to somebody else. As Jesus' children, we are in a fallen world, but because of him, we look different. John 15, 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, God chose us out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's not going to be an easy path. It will not be smooth and steady. That's the, the world will reject us, persecute us, and say false things against us. Remember the last time we heard this? Pastor Glenn was preaching those words on the Sermon on the Mount. When you're persecuted and people say false things against you because of me, then that's when you know that the Lord is working in your heart and other people's hearts because they are persecuting you, not because they hate you, but because they hate Jesus in you. Was it easy for the Israelites in the desert? They had maybe the greatest leader ever in Moses, and it was still difficult. They went through daily challenges. Things will not be easy, but with prayer we speak with the one who knows us and created us for his glory and his righteousness. Charles Stanley says, I, I try to watch Charles Stanley every week. I think he's retired now, but you can still catch him on like 6.30 on Sunday mornings. Prayer is one of the most important activities in our lives because we're actually talking to the sovereign God of the universe who has all power and knowledge. He understands how we feel, knows what we think, and has the power to intervene in every area of life. So, recap, why do we pray? Prayer takes us beyond our human efforts. Prayer is a great stress reliever. I, amen to that. When we have God in our corner, we don't need anybody else. 
Prayer strengthens our spirit. Prayer helps us resist temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation that sees you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not te- let you be tempted beyond what you can handle, but when you are, he will provide a way out. I say 1 Corinthians 10, 13, almost every day, so that when I am faced with those temptations, God puts that, that scripture verse on my heart. Prayer keeps us from becoming anxious. That kind of goes hand in hand with stress reliever. Prayer works, by the way. And finally, because Jesus prayed. So that's prayer. Now we're going to shift quickly, quickly to missions. And this is another very, very familiar verse. And and this is really a verse that I know a lot of you or verses that you all have memorized this. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So let's break that down a little bit in the next few minutes. Now, the gospel is for all, but it wasn't like that originally, was it? The law of Moses had been given just to the Jews. Again, we're talking Old Testament stuff. In Matthew 10, during the personal ministry of Jesus, the focus was always on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the religious leaders. Both the law and the ministry of Jesus were making way for the universal gospel, Jews and Gentiles. The law had been a barrier to such, but Jesus removed that. He took care of that. It is always our obligation to make sure that what we teach is the gospel of Christ. There are many other gospels, but to preach them makes us enemies of God. And um, I'm going to talk about something in a minute that that, uh, Pastor Rick mentioned on Wednesday also. Galatians 1.9 says, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be eternally condemned. So again, on Wednesday night, we were talking about living assurance. We're in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And Rick mentioned uh, this a little bit, that there are many false doctrines. There are many false teachers and prophets. They are all around. And they were also, we had a little discussion about this, they were also everywhere in the the early church, the New Testament, uh, the first century church. But you know, I think it's even more prevalent today. That's why... We have to gauge everything by God's word. That's our gold standard. I, actually, I think, I think platinum's more expensive than gold. So that should be our platinum standard. That everything we gauge, whatever the world says, whatever somebody says, maybe your grandmother said something or your granddad, put it up against God's word and see what it says. Because God's word is righteous and it's holy, it's timeless, and it's infallible. That's the only word we should trust. The gospel's message is a call to repentance and obedience. It includes the message of the holiness of God and the judgment to come. Our goal is to help turn people into followers of Christ, as Matthew 28, 19 says. That's why when you leave Bayside Church, you're entering the mission field because people are dying every day without Christ. 153,500 people die every day. Check it. I Googled it. Most of them die outside of a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, are we, to, are we to save the whole world? We couldn't. Even if we could stay up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we couldn't possibly do that. But we can share Jesus with those around us. Maybe it's a Uh, a mom or a dad. I had a great conversation. My mom's a believer, but I had a great conversation with my mom a couple weeks ago. She's in an assisted living place and some Jehovah's Witness are are coming in and she asked me why why she shouldn't listen to Jehovah's Witness. So I was able to talk to her for several minutes and pray and gave her a couple of scripture verses and thank you to Pastor Rick who has had that experience too at his door and he's helped me with that. But you know, there are a lot of people out there that are going to preach and teach that false doctrine. And we've got to be very, very aware of that and be ready uh, when, when someone does confront us with that. 
It includes the message of holiness of God and the judgment to come. So that's why we, we have to be, we have to be um, doers of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. As disciples of Jesus, we seek to look at things the way he does, at sin, at others, at God, and at his word, and at ourselves, so that we can live out and emulate him. We talked a little bit about this two weeks ago on Wednesday night, where I asked Pastor Glenn and Pastor Rick, who were your role models growing up? And I knew the answer. For Pastor Rick, if you've spent five minutes with him, he, he talks about his granddad and just such a high, uh, just such a high esteem for him. And then for, for Glenn, it was his mom and dad. Now, Tilly is still with us. Roger is not. But I knew Roger and I know Tilly. And Glenn, his life emulates his mom and dad. It emulates Christ, but I see so much of Roger and Tilly in them. And I'm sure for Rick, it's the same thing with his granddad. We are called to emulate, to look like, to talk like, to be like Christ. Jesus also made it clear about baptism's role in the gospel. He said that the baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is what we do in making believers into disciples. Jesus also said this was true for all nations. When this happens, the baptized person shall be saved. See, none of this is us. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit doing this. We're just the conduit. We're the catalyst. Maybe God puts us in that area. I think Paul and Apollos, you know, Paul watered, Apollos, um, what was it? You know, you know the story. But God will use the Holy Spirit. We just have to be faithful to tell others about Christ, and then he takes care of it from there. Matthew closes with one of the most comforting statements in all of Scripture. He, as Lord, promises to be with us, the church, always, even until the end of days, the end of all things. This ending reminds us of the person of Jesus in his earthly life, the one who shared space with people, lived and was present with them, and showed us what God is like. Pastor Richard Beaton says, The commission is for all who are part of the people of God and incorporates the task of making disciples with teaching and baptizing as the movement expands around the world. Remember, when we give to our missionaries, our international missions, those missionaries are all around the world, six continents. So we are helping to facilitate that. The church at its core is to live out the teachings of Christ as a witness within our world. So pray, 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 and tell, tell, tell the good news of Christ. We're going to watch a video now. And after that, I'll come back for a closing prayer. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, we will be meeting Wednesday night, Living Assurance. Uh, that is from 6.30 to 7.30. We also have online prayer. I know I'm driving the people uh, in the booth crazy. Uh, online prayer at 5.30. You can join us. We're, we're in the sanctuary. As well as um, you, can, you can join us by Zoom. And again, Cassie and, and uh, Joy will send those links out to you. And we also will be having our Valentine's party for Children's Church next week, February 14th. That's a little hint to you men. Next Sunday is February 14th. Next Sunday is February 14th. Next Sunday is February 14th. We don't have anything else to say with that. And then we're doing a teen event on Friday, February 19th. That will also be a Valentine party for our Midland High School Department. Praise God for you all and for tuning in. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for prayer. Lord, thank you for missions. Thank you for calling this church to the high standards of these things. Thank you for a church that prays. Thank you for a church that gathers, for a church that is missions-minded. Lord, not just talking about it, not talking the talk, but walking the walk. Lord, that's what you call us to do. And may you guide and direct us as you lead us into missions 
again, close by, but maybe around the world. It's certainly around the state or across the country. But Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in a place where you can use us as we share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And Lord, certainly be with Pastor Glenn and Sherry and Anna and Tilly as they're in Florida. Lord, for some much needed rest and relaxation, guide and direct them, comfort them. And we just thank you for this godly family whom you have placed in this church for such a time as this to honor you, to point to you, and to live lives as the shepherds of this flock and to be faithful to your infallible and perfect word. Thank you for the blessings. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy, everyone. <laughs>